Okay, so um, what I want to talk about today is some of the ways in which mixing occurs in the ocean and some of the ways that we're, some of the new techniques we're using to try and understand uh, various aspects of that mixing. So why are we interested in thinking about um, Why are we interested in thinking about mixing in the ocean? Well, one of the grand challenges we have at the moment is to understand the Earth's climate system um, as well as we possibly can. And there's a lot that goes into that climate system, a lot goes into the energy budget um, of our entire climate. And one of those factors, which is um, often overlooked in, in popular science, but is very crucial to the whole balance, is mixing in the ocean. And this is mixing of um, heat and salt um, from way down in the depths of the ocean where typically it's a lot colder, a lot more salty, um, up through the depth of the ocean towards the surface which is typically fresher and warmer. And so one of the most powerful techniques we have um, at our disposal to, to try and understand the climate is, is large-scale simulations like you can see a, a movie playing of here. And these are called global circulation models. And this is a particular um, simulation conducted by, by NASA using the MIT global circulation model. And you are seeing various um, um, streaks of little parcels of fluid going about their business on the surface of the ocean in this particular movie. And what these models do is they, they, they essentially couple together what's happening in the atmosphere and what's happening in the ocean and try and understand them either together or separately to really try and figure out what's going on. One of the um, challenges with, with such a large simulation is that the, the amount of resolution you can really apply to this simulation is extremely coarse. You might only have uh, information every several kilometers and you're trying to piece together um, a, a sort of grid on this uh, surface of the ocean, which is several kilometers apart, and understand how um, everything links together. And that require that relies on a lot of um, a lot of processes happening at extremely small scales. So there are lots of things happening at small scales, and you need to be able to parameterize what's happening at say the millimeter scale, the centimeter scale, the meter scale and parameterize that, scale it up to say something important about the kilometer scale, what's actually happening um, on average in our ocean at any given moment. And one of the um, important processes that is happening on a very small scale is mixing. And so in particular, the amount of mixing that is occurring, mixing of heat and of salt through the ocean, really is an active area of research. And to sort of emphasize that, I've put two um, uh, journal papers that have um, been published in the last six months or so, which really emphasize this. Uh, the first one is, is open questions in this sort of mixing. Do we even know what we do not know? And that was published, I think, in November. And then just last month, there was another paper that came out confronting grand challenges in environmental fluid mechanics. And one of the grand challenges they identify is this sort of mixing which is going on in the ocean to really understand it. So when I refer to um, ocean mixing, what am I really talking about? Well, the ocean mixes in a lot of different ways. And this nice cartoon shows lots of different processes that are going on, which cause, could cause mixing. There's a lot of stuff going on at the surface with winds and waves, precipitation, radiation, causing some sort of circulation near the surface, bringing um, surface water down, and then bringing slightly lower water up to the surface. Um, there's also mixing associated with rivers inputting fresh water, um, melt from, from the ice sheets, which is very cold and hence quite dense. And so it tends to flow along the bottom of the ocean surface and cascade down, mix with the interior water as it goes. There's also a lot of mixing that occurs as tides oscillate back and forth over bottom topography on the bottom of the ocean. What I want to focus on today is actually in this red circle here, um, internal mixing. And this is essentially 
mixing between different streams of, of water, different currents, one on top of the other um, in what I'm going to talk about today, that as they go past each other, there is an exchange and a mixing between those two layers. And unlike this cartoon, um, most of the ocean is indeed a long way away from all of these boundaries. And so a lot of the ocean is undergoing uh, an amount of internal mixing and the internal mixing is going to be quite important to try and um, think about. Parameterizing this internal mixing, how much mixing, when is the mixing happening, what does it achieve, that is an absolutely monumental challenge. If I were to sort of represent uh, as, as, as a metaphor, um, the, the, the grid that my big climate model simulation is going on, and I have maybe one grid cell on the top of this stadium here, and one grid point at the bottom of the stadium, and one on the left, and one on the right. And um, I might know the, the, the fluid velocity at the top and at the bottom, and I might know the temperature and the salt content and various other things at the top and at the bottom. Over a small period of time, I need to be able to say, how does the heat content at the top, for example, get transported to the bottom? How much of it gets transported across that distance? Um, and how quickly does that happen? Now, the problem is that the, the processes, the physical processes that are allowing that heat to move from top to bottom um, are comparatively happening on the scale of the blade of grass um, on, the, on the pitch here. And so there's, there's this immense separation in scales of what we've got to try and understand this process and then scale it up to get a lot of information over a very long distance. What, what does this sort of mixing often look like? Um, here is a, some data taken in, in the ocean and it's published in this paper. And this is two streams of fluid flowing um, relative to each other, uh, one on top of the other. And you can see the top stream is quite warm and the bottom one is quite cold comparatively. And as they go past each other, they interact in some way so that we create these sort of um, billow-like structures on the interface between these two streams of water, kind of like a, a bill hook that's sort of curving around. And what's happening there is that this colder water down here is being drawn up, um, drawn up and wrapped around in the middle here. And so the cold water is essentially being deposited um, into this central sort of uh, um, central vortex in the middle here and hot water at the same time is being drawn down and mixed in with it. And so these two streams are essentially becoming much more mixed together. This is only one way in which two streams moving past each other um, can mix. There are in fact, well, there are several ways. I'm gonna talk about three ways in which these things could uh, mix together. And there are many different mechanisms that could lead to this mixing. So say for sake of argument, there were only three ways. I mean, there are more, but if there were only three, what we would like to know is out of all of the mixing that happens in the ocean, how much is due to mechanism A, how much is due to mechanism B, and how much is due to mechanism C? Is it 60%, 30%, 10%? And if it were, then we could really start saying about how we scale up things that are happening down here to a much larger scale. Something that compounds this issue of scaling up from small scales to big scales is the fact that unlike what you might have uh, as a vision in your mind about what the ocean looks like in terms of its physics, um, there is a lot of structure in the ocean. It's not necessarily always the case that the surface is relatively warm and the bottom is relatively cold and that the temperature just varies very smoothly from the top to the bottom and it just changes very nicely. That is often not the case. Um, the ocean is often layered um, in many different places for many different reasons um, and I will indicate what that layering looks like. So here is um, some data taken quite a long time ago now looking at uh, on the vertical here, we have depth, so from the surface. So we start at 900 meters depth, and we keep going as we go up here. 
And what these are plotting is the temperature that they have recorded in degrees Celsius and the salt content in parts per thousand. And this, by the way, was taken underneath the, Medi the Mediterranean outflow. So the Mediterranean um, outflows into the Atlantic, kind of over a sill and into the Atlantic, and it, it mixes with the Atlantic. And this data essentially starts just below where that outflow is coming into the Atlantic. So below that, we're looking at Atlantic water. And what we see is that there are regions of extremely well mixed fluid. So here is a region where the temperature T is roughly constant over quite a quite a bit of depth. And then here's another region where the temperature is kind of constant over a, a significant depth, separated by a very rapid change in temperature to another region which is almost constant temperature. And the same happens in the salt profile. In this data, the the um the depth of these well mixed regions are on the order of 20, 30 meters deep. And then this rapid change that the interface between one layer and the next layer is on the order of, of a meter or so. So if we have layers in the ocean of temperature and salt content, that means we have layers in the ocean of density because the density of water is affected by temperature and salt. So we have regions which are essentially these layers and essentially whenever layers of fluid flow past each other, there is the potential for mixing and exchange of salt and heat across that interface as they flow by. This is um, borne out um, not only just in the deep ocean, but here is um, some data taken from the Fraser River estuary. So this is um, some estuarine water and this is an echo sound um, taken along the stretch of this water for a certain distance um, upstream. And what you are seeing here is you're seeing the fresh river water on the top, which is actually flowing from right to left in this picture. And at the bottom, you see the salt intrusion of the salt water, which has come a certain distance upstream. They also measured the velocity of this water. So you can see the fresh water on top is, is moving to the left with some velocity. And then at this particular moment in the tidal cycle, um, the salt water intrusion is almost stationary. So these two streams are moving past each other like this. You can see that one is fresh and one is salty by measuring the density of this water as you go down and that the upper layer is relatively less dense compared to the lower layer, which is more dense. And as these two streams of water flow relative to each other, you can see there is some sort of structures here at the interface between them. And these are the same sort of bill hook like structures which are causing mixing of the salty water with the fresh water um, across the, that interface. Um, the last example I want to briefly show you is actually a freshwater example, um, but the same sort of ideas are, are going on in freshwater as in salt water. This is a some temperature data taken in, well, on the right here is Lake Ontario, which is one of the great lakes separating Canada and America. And it goes a very long way out here. It's a very big lake. And on the left here, this is Hamilton Harbor. The city of Hamilton is about here. And then they have a very large harbor for container ships. And they want to get their container ships from the harbor out to the lake. And they do this through a canal and the canal is about a kilometer long and about 100 meters wide. Um, and that's how we, uh, we, we, we move like that. So what happens is that at certain times of the year, the prevailing wind on Lake Ontario causes um, an upwelling or an uprush of the very cold um, Lake Ontario water from the very depths of the lake, which is way out here somewhere. And that cold water upwells Towards the, towards the canal, spills over that, that sill there and comes plunging into the Hamilton Harbor. And at the same time, to compensate, the relatively warm surface water has to go the other way, it has to go back through the canal. And so you get an exchange of warm and cold water, layers, and there is mixing at the interface between them. So I hope 
what I've convinced you with this slide is that layers of different density, because temperature and salt can also be layered, are really ubiquitous in the oceans and a lot of other places besides. And that when you shear, when you have two of these layers moving relative to each other, you can lead to a lot of mixing uh, between those layers across the interfaces. So what are the ways in, in which mixing can happen that I want to talk about today? That there are lots of ways that mixing is, is happening in the ocean. Um, not all of the ocean is layered, not all of the ocean obviously is always moving relative to each other, just um, left to right. But there are many scenarios where that does happen. And I want to talk about those sorts of scenarios today. I'm also going to talk about um, mixing that happens relatively quickly and on relatively small scales. What that means is that the fact that the Earth is rotating um, has little effect on what I want to talk about today, because what I'm talking about are things that happen too quickly for the rotation to really be important and are on too small of a scale for the rotation to be important. So these are just simply two streams of water moving past each other and what happens. So when you restrict yourself to this sort of discussion, just two streams moving past each other, um, there are essentially only three things that can happen. And they are written here. These are the fancy names of them, Kelvin Helmholtz, Holmbo, and Taylor Caulfield. And I'm just going to label them A, B, and C for this uh, particular um, talk. Um, and I'm actually going to start by explaining what happens in B here, in the Holmbo um, case. So if I have two layers of fluid, one layer is, 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 is a, a, a less dense layer. And then underneath it, there is a more dense layer. So this is supposed to be a density profile. Um, and here you have the, the um, less dense water above the more dense water. And then there is this relatively rapid change between the two densities at this interface here. What could happen to that interface? Well, many of you and probably all of you are familiar with an extreme version of this. An extreme version of this would be the difference between the air and the ocean. So air is extremely less dense compared to the ocean density, but there is an interface between those two things. It's a little bit different because that interface has surface tension and stuff and these don't, but broadly speaking, it, it's a similar sort of phenomenon. What happens at this air-ocean interface is you get waves. You naturally get waves occurring at that interface. And the same is going to happen on these internal interfaces. Now, in the internal interfaces, this density difference is nowhere near as extreme as the one between water and air. It's probably only about a percent or so in terms of a density difference. But the same sort of idea might happen. So we've, got, we've set the scene for potentially a wave um, arriving on this interface. A wave on its own doesn't really do much, it just moves along. Um, it has to get very big to sort of break and crash and cause mixing between the two um, regions. It has to get very big. How can we make a wave here get very big? The answer is to also remember that these are two streams of water that are moving past each other relative to each other. And if you have a, a velocity profile here where the top bit up here is moving to the right and then from some point which is about here from that point downwards the the flow is gradually slowing down slowing down slowing down maybe towards the floor or something where it has to be zero but also anywhere else um, it's just slowing down um, as you go down this provides a way of making this wave on the interface get bigger and bigger and bigger. Why might that be? Well, this elbow, whenever you have an elbow like this in, in a velocity profile, there is a mechanism by which um, the fluid wants to oscillate when it is nearby one of these elbows. Why, why might that be? Well, if I think about putting a, a sort of long, thin object like a pen or something, if I put a pen in the water here and I put a pen here, 
Well, because the top of the pen is moving faster than the bottom of the pen, it will start spinning. So a pen would, would start spinning and it would actually kind of align a bit, but it, it, would, it wouldn't just stay like that. It would rotate because the top is moving faster than the bottom. Whereas if I put a pen up in this region, the pen would just move along with the flow because there's no change, um, the top and the bottom moving at the same speed. But if I put a pen at the elbow, well, half of it wants to sort of rotate and spin and the other half just wants to move along. And what you end up kind of happening is that um, this object will sort of rotate a bit and then move along and then rotate and then move along. And it will do this cyc cyclically at the top. So there is a way in which the flow wants to oscillate things that are nearby that elbow. So, so now we have two things that can oscillate. We have some sort of rotating, rotational oscillation up here and a wave, a, a wave which is an oscillation down here. Whenever you have two things that can oscillate, they can resonate. So resonance, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term, but when you set your um, washing machine going and it starts the spin cycle, it starts spinning out slowly and everything's fine and it goes faster and faster and faster. And then at some point it hits a certain speed where your entire countertop starts vibrating like mad. And then as it speeds up a bit further, everything calms down and the washing machine goes about its business. At that point where the countertop is resonating like crazy, that's because the countertop wants to resonate at that, wants to oscillate at that particular rate if it can. And the washing machine is also oscillating at that rate. And so you get this resonance phenomenon. And exactly the same thing can happen here. So when I play this movie, what you'll see is you'll see a small wave starting to grow and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger as it resonates with an elbow in the, in the flow located about there. And eventually they'll get caught up with each other and wrap around. So here's the wave it's growing. And now it sort of gets en enveloped in whatever was happening above it. And what you can see is happening now is that part of this darker, denser water is being dragged up, rotated around and mixed into the upper um, bit of water. So let me see if I can pause this at just the right moment. That wasn't the right moment. There we go. Um, what was happening there is whenever something left, whenever something exited the, from the left, it reappeared in the right. So it, it's, it's like I'm sort of sampling a very, very, very long chain of these things, which are all sort of sliding along, and then I'm seeing each one coming past. But each one of these cat's eyes, what they're doing is that they are drawing dense fluid up, smearing it across this lid of the cat's eye, and then rotating it in and mixing it with this bit of fluid in here. And once that has been set up, they're very robust objects. It takes quite a lot to, um, to sort of break this object down and it will essentially continue on mixing for quite a long period of time. And, and it will continue just drawing very thin filaments of water out and around and mix them in. It's not doing a lot of mixing, but it is doing a little bit of mixing for a very long time. So let, let's move on to a, um, A, let's move on to this type of mixing. If I forget about a density difference for a second, and I just think about two streams of fluid moving past each other, then I could be in a scenario where my flow, the top bit's moving to the right, the bottom bit's moving to the left, and there's some variation between those two speeds. And that is roughly speaking going to introduce for us two elbows in that velocity profile. And now I can have a, a, a wobble here, resonating with um, um, and another oscillation down here. And these two locations can resonate with each other and get wrapped around each other, just like you saw over here. What is different here is that um, this is all about the, the, the flow speed causing something to resonate and wrap around. And kind of for illustration purposes, I've put in another density field, a, a, a light fluid top of a dense fluid. I've put this right in the middle of this um, sort of elbow construction. So it's right in the middle here. But in this example, it's a very, very small density difference. Um, 
I know the colours are the same, but this one was actually quite a large difference in density, and this one's quite a small one. And so the fact that there is a density difference isn't going to um, prevent the flow from doing what it wants to do. The density field is just going to come along for the ride. So let's watch that happen. There is this incredibly rapid burst of mixing where the top and bottom get wrapped around each other and get wrapped around each other. And then there's an awful lot of very rapid rotation around this central part here. And you can see we've created an entire extra layer of fluid in this way. We start with the two layers and we've, we've finished with kind of three essentially, where this middle bit is, the middle color here is exactly one part of this and one part of that to be mixed together to form that intermediate fluid. But what you can see perhaps is that from about now onwards, not much is really happening. It was very intense for a very short period of time, and then it sort of settled down. I mean, it's spinning, it's spinning very rapidly, but it's not really mixing anything anymore. It's not really drawing up this fluid and drawing down that into the middle much um, anymore. So this is very short-lived, but vigorous while it is doing that mixing, certainly compared to this flow, which is much more patient and slow and gradual in the amount of mixing it was doing. Finally, we come on to the third example. If I have two ways that things can oscillate, they can oscillate at an elbow and they can oscillate as a wave between um, these interfaces. And I've just shown you a case where two elbows resonate I've shown you a case where an elbow resonates with a wave on the interface. There is only one more way I can combine these things to produce another sort of resonance. And that is if I try to make one wave on one um, interface to resonate with another wave on another interface. And so there really are only three possibilities here. It's all of the combinations of things that can interact with each other. Turns out for this one, you actually also need to provide a bit of a flow so that the flow is sort of going to the right here and to the left there and sort of smoothly changing across the, uh, the three layers. And this basically holds the waves in place. And what you'll see now is, is very small waves arriving, but they're going to be frozen in the picture and they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as they resonate with each other and they get uh, larger amplitude. You can kind of see them now and they're gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then something else happens where you pinch off this large rotating sausage, which kind of leaves the window here and goes back in here. That kind of pulsated and bounced and precipitated a smaller cousin in the middle. That smaller cousin sort of bounced around and that caused a third smaller one here to, uh, to arrive. And then that sort of caused a, a quaternary version right here to arrive. And so you get this cascade of something really big from the big wave sort of crashing and, and, and separating off from each other. And then a whole bunch of sort of um, siblings um, that sort of arrive in all of the gaps and produce a, a, a cascade of these sorts of structures. As time goes on, various other things happen and you get this sort of sloshing backwards and forwards. You're pulling in um, dense fluid at the bottom here. Um, which is all sloshing in and getting whipped around and put into here. If I just freeze it briefly at this moment, you can see that there is fluid being from that's dense at the bottom being drawn up and round and sort of smeared across here and mixed into this large rotating pill-shaped object. And this superficially looks similar to this one, but it's different for a very important reason it's much slower. This is a much calmer sort of gentle rotation through that pill shaped region. Whereas this is extremely rapid and it gets more and more rapid the closer into the middle you get. So given that these are our three possibilities, what we would like to know is all of the times in the ocean where you have two streams moving past each other like this, what percentage of the time um, it does the mixing look like case A, case B, and case C. Is it 60%, 30%, 10%? That would be fantastic information. B 
because each one of them has a very distinct amount of mixing and the intensity of the mixing. And you can probably see this was very intense mixing. This was not very intense. And this was somewhere in the middle. So how might we start answering that question? Well, we need to look at real ocean data and to categorize everything we see and say, well, I've seen this. Does it represent A, B or C or you know, any other of the many other ways that mixing could happen? And, and, and how could I make that decision? This is a quite a big challenge and, it, and it's a big challenge because we actually know surprisingly little about the dynamics of the deep ocean. Um, this map shows all of the locations where we have data about what's going on in the ocean. And this is really quite sparse, actually. A lot of these points just represent one measurement. Um, we know more about the surface of the moon than we really do about what's going on down in the ocean. Um, and therefore, as modelers and as people who do simulations and mathematics and various things like that, it's almost our responsibility to squeeze as much info as we possibly can out of this data set to use it to the, the, the best of our abilities. And what we would really like to do is be able to categorize every single one of these points um, in terms of what sort of mixing was observed and therefore start building up these percentages of what happens due, due to each sort of type. And, and what each of these points will typically provide um, is something like, as you go down through the ocean, there is some velocity recorded. So it's moving to the right, it slows down, going to the left, slows down again um, as you go through. And also potentially the, the density or maybe just the temperature or the salt or something like that. And that might have you know, a layer here, a thin interface, a layer, then a thin interface, then a layer. Now, I'm not saying that all of these points have all of this information. Some will have some of it, some will have more than this, and you know, there'll be a variance in what you actually have as data. But whenever we can at least estimate a picture like this from the data, we can start asking the question, given this profile, just a straight line down through the ocean, and measuring these two things. Given that information, can we predict what type of mixing will happen next? Because if we can predict what's going to happen next, then we've just observed, essentially, we've observed that thing about to happen. We can also maybe try and get two pieces of information out of this. Not only can we ask what's going to happen next, we could also ask what happened in the first place a little time before to bring us to this point. So what just happened to bring us to this bit of data in the first place? So can we predict what's gonna happen in the future in terms of mixing and what just happened in the past in terms of mixing? And so I did some work a couple of years ago trying to start to bring together a, a method of doing this. And it's published in this um, paper here we have some sort of ideas about how you might be able to predict future mixing by understanding conservation of energy. Because as mixing happens, it's going to change the kinetic energy, potentially how quickly things are moving, and also the potential energy, where the density is moving. Is it coming up or down? Is it wrapping around itself? And by being able to predict how much of the energy is going to go into um, changes in kinetic energy and how much is going to go into changes in potential energy, we can start estimating what sort of mixing might happen. So if a lot of it's going to go into kinetic energy, chances are it's going to be a Kelvin-Helmholtz type A, which wraps around very quickly. And if a lot of it's going to go into potential energy, that might be something more like the, the type C, the taylor Coldfield, where everything sort of wobbles around and gets sort of, you know, there's a lot of density interfaces moving up and down all the time. The, the details get quite technical, so I'm actually going to leave that there and move on to a, a, a brief description of um, how we might do the other side of this, predict the past mixing. So what has just happened? And what we also managed to show is that in these admittedly very idealized scenarios, um, we managed to show that after mixing has settled down, 
So this is the last frame of the Kelvin Helmholtz movie I showed you. This is the density field. This is basically when it is all settled down. When it's all settled down, there is a unique relationship between the two following, um, well, there are these two following unique relationships. And I'll sort of talk about what they mean. By the way, the things in brackets here are specialist terms for any experts that are in the audience, but I'm gonna try and keep it as intuitive as I can. There's gonna be a unique relationship between the density and the flux and the amount of rotation and the flux. So this is best seen by me talking through something like this. So here's the last frame of our movie. And what's happening it, it, up here, for example, is that a bit of fluid up here is sort of moving along a, a streamline like this. So it's this bit of fluid as it evolves forward in time will have to come down to the dip a bit and then back up and then down. And it will sort of follow that ridge like that. That's where the flow is going. And the flux at say this point is just the total amount of fluid which is going through that point along in that direction that it wants to go. So the amount of water coming through that point is gonna give us essentially the flux. What about the rotation at this point? Well, the, the fluid is coming down, so it's sort of having to rotate downwards a bit, and then it's having to rotate back upwards a bit, and then it has to rotate back down. So the amount of rotation at that point, we can also sort of describe it to how, how curved this path is and how much it's kind of having to go up and down, up and down. What this grand statement means is that if I take a point right here and I measure the flux at the point and I measure the rotation at that point, and I come to a graph and I, okay, so it was maybe about this much flux and only a tiny bit of rotation up here. Um, and I put it on a graph and I get a point right there. So I get a point right there, which is representing that point in the flow. And then I come along and I look at this point up here. And I say, okay, well, what's the flux at that point and what's the rotation at that point? And it's going to be a little bit less flux perhaps and a little bit less rotation because it's further away from this sort of dip. And so it gets less flux and less rotation. It's the point right there. I then come right into the middle of my rotating vortex. And right in the middle, there is a lot of rotation. This thing is spinning round and round and round really quite quickly. And it's, so there's a lot of flux because it's very rapid and there's a lot of rotation. So I take the point right in the middle and I get this point down here, um, that much flux and that much rotation. And if I take every single point in this entire picture, find the flux at the point and the rotation at the point and put them all on this graph, you might think I'm just gonna get a mess. There's gonna be, there's gonna be things everywhere doing all sorts of different things. But what we showed and what we have in this picture is actually all of the information collapses onto one line. So here's one line, which is every single point in this entire picture. And this is really quite crucial. Um, when you measure something in the ocean, you're never gonna get a picture like this very often. What you will often have is a line straight down. It might not go through the middle, but I'll discuss what a line through the middle might look like. If I imagine going down on this line and I'm starting up here, the, we've actually defined the flux to be zero at the top and all of these numbers are relative to the top. So the top is zero and everything else is relative to that. So it's zero up here and a bit of rotation and I come down through my data and there's still, well, there's a bit less flux, but there's still not much rotation. And then I cross this interface into the center core and I go over a little bit of a hump. And then as I go down through the vortex right to the middle, I start finding all of this data going right down to the middle of the vortex. And then if I carry on going down, I actually reverse my journey. I start seeing less flux, less rotation. And then I come over this edge and I see this little hump in the flux and rotation. And then I carry on and I sort of flatten that back up here. And the really important bit is I could go, I, my ocean data is almost never gonna go right through the middle of one of these. It probably goes through the edge. You know, it's gonna go through some random point because I don't know when I'm sampling. But if I go through the edge here, what I do is I come down, as I go down here, I go over this interface and I go over the hump. And then I come down to the middle and I start exploring down this curve, but I might stop here. 
I never sample the center, but I do sample quite a lot of it. And then as I carry on down, I, I reverse from here, go back over the hump and out. So no matter where I happen to have randomly sampled, I will see part of this shape and it's very characteristic and it's actually essentially an exponential. How does this play out for the other, um, the other dynamics we have? Well, for the Taylor Coalfield, the type C, there is actually very little rotation going on here. Everything is very gentle. It's not no, anywhere near as violent as that central core in type A mixing. It's a lot less, it's a lot more gentle. And the rotation almost everywhere is about minus one in this, the way I've scaled things. What happens this time is if we go on a line down through the simulation, I start with zero flux at the top, and I, I the flux gradually sort of decreases as I go down. And then I get to this interface, and that interface has a lot of rotation associated with it. And that is because whenever you have um, like a, a density surface here, which is bent, it would like to spring back because spring back is, is like minimizing its potential energy and you're sort of like forcing it to be bent. It would like to spring back, but it, it can't. But the fact that it would like to spring back means that it induces quite a lot of rotation in the flow right at that point. So there's a blip as I go across the interface. I come right down into the middle and I settle out down here with a little bit of rotation and a little loss of flux down in the middle. And I keep going down and I reverse, I go back across that interface over the blip, back through, and then as I transfer, traverse over the other side, I, I settle out here. If I go right through this one, which is like a smaller version of the big one, I get exactly the same thing. I come down here, I have a blip as I cross over that interface, I come down, down here, as I go to the center, and then as I carry on, I come back and over the blip and like that. Essentially, these are similar shapes and similar dynamics, and there's a real symmetry to what is going on. The tiny little flick up here is that baby vortex, which hasn't quite managed to form properly. And so, although the rest of it looks exactly the same for that baby one, the interior is just a tiny bit different. So I explained things in terms of plotting a rotation against a flux, and you get a distinctive curve. You don't get a mess, you get a curve, um, no matter you know what you're doing here. I, I chose to talk about those two because they were the easiest to explain for type A and type C, but for type B, the easiest to explain is the density and the flux version. So here I have um, the, the end of my Hongbo type B, and I start this time at the bottom where the flux is zero at the bottom and everything is relative to that. So it's zero at the bottom and it's quite dense. It's just normalized to be one is dense and minus one is less dense. So it's quite dense at the bottom and you come up through here and you, you get gradually less flux, but the density is the same. You cross over that interface and the density very rapidly changes. And then you flick up here to a little bit above minus one inside here. And that's because the inside here is actually had a little bit of this fluid mixed into it. So it's not quite the same color as that. It's a tiny bit different. And you flick up into here and then you keep on going up through your data. You cross over the top eyelid of the, of the cat's eye shape and you come back up and then you come back down like that onto the upper layer where the density really is minus one. And so you get this very characteristic shape of what's going on. So the last thing I want to show you is what we can actually do with this. Like, why is this useful? Well, now I can go away from my idealized simulations and go look in the real world again. And here I have some data taken in the ocean. This, by the way, this paper has fantastic data. This is only a small, small, tiny slither of it. Uh, they have a lot of it and it's really very beautiful and very nice. And what this is showing is, is some hot water and some cold water flowing past each other and being mixed through these sort of Bill Hook-like Kelvin Helmholtz mixing um, phenomenon. And they provide, um, at a certain line down here, they provide um, one of these profiles. So the flow is moving, I think, to the left, and then it's going to the right again. 
and they also provide the density on a line through this. We can take that line of information, that sample through the um, ocean, and we can, work, we can estimate what the rotation is within that data and what the flux is within that data, and we can plot that. We can plot the rotation at each point and the flux at each point along that line, and we find something that plunges into the middle of these rotating billows and then back out again in basically an exponential-like shape. Now, then they don't come down and up exactly the same way because nature is never symmetric and our simulations were. Um, but you have this very characteristic shape down and out. For the other two, there is no ocean data that represents this, but there are some experiments. Here is an experimental image of the Hongbo in, um, mechanism where you have the cat's eye and stuff being drawn around and um, round, round. And they also provide a line of data through the middle here. And when you find the density of that line and the flux associated with that line, you get this three pronged shape, just like we do in our simulations. And then finally on Taylor Coalfield, this is the only experimental image that exists, but you can again take a line through here that they provide and you can find the rotation and the flux and you get this sort of almost constant rotation a blip as you go into the middle, and then you come back across the blip and back out, just like we have in the simulations, except again, nature isn't completely symmetric, so you get two little blips. Now, what you might be thinking is this is all sort of stargazing and comparing pictures, but, and this is my final slide, how might you go about um, taking all of the ocean data we know and cataloging it, saying this is this type, this is another type, this is another type, you're going to use a computer. You, you, it, there's too much to really do by hand. And more precisely than that, you're probably going to not use a computer, but use a machine learning algorithm to decide this. And what machine learning algorithms are very good at doing is identifying different pictures. They're identifying patterns in different quantities. They can tell cats from dogs very easily. And what we are doing here is providing ocean data, formulating the data in terms of the right objects, rotation, flux, density, and asking a machine learning algorithm to find pictures for us, categorize the data. So we have a, a scheme perhaps where we can input some ocean data and that will then output for us the type of mixing that, that data represents. This is very early days of all the simulations I've shown have been very pure and nice and symmetric. So we, we're sort of making this more realistic all the time. And I'm working with two collaborators, Alexis Kaminsky at UC Berkeley, and, and, and we're starting to look at verifying this sort of scheme where you input and output what you want. We're verifying it for a wider variety of flows, more messy flows and comparing, starting the comparison to real ocean data. And then with um, Hissam Saliapur, who is at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, we are beginning to actually start training a, a machine learning algorithm, or at least investigating how feasible this is, that uses exactly this sort of scheme. And we're training it on much messier simulations, which even though this looks a lot messier than my Kelvin Helmholtz, if you put a line through here and you look at my, um, my diagnostic, my diagnostic says that this is the aftermath of a Kelvin Helmholtz event, even though it's a lot messier and the maths doesn't quite match up when it's quite so messy. So once we've done this, we, we you know, we all got this target in mind of trying to catalog our ocean data sets. And that is really because we want to inform a much, well, a, 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 as, as good of a mixing parameterization of this sort of mixing uh, that we can. So that's the end of my talk. These are my conclusions. Uh, my contact details are right here at the bottom if anyone wants to talk about any of this later on. Um, and otherwise, I'm happy to take some questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom, for making what I think sounds like a really complicated subject more accessible and some fantastic visualizations included as well. Um, so for anyone who wants to submit, submit a question right now, please submit it in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of the screen if you're joining us on Zoom or on the live chat on YouTube, you can submit a question through there as well. I've got a very basic question, which was just a very sm small snippet of what you described earlier. Um, the coal field 
um, data that you showed on your previous slide, you said that that was the only piece of data demonstrating this type of mixing. Does that just kind of mean it's more rare? Is that, can I use that kind of terminology? Yes. Um, I, how come we've not seen this type of mixing as yeah, often? I, I believe it, it, it's probably more rare. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's probably more rare. Um, I think so. So actually, the, 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 there are there are two bits of experimental data, and the other one is in the same paper. So there are two photos, um, and they're both as poor quality as this. In fact, this is the first time it was really seen, and that's why it actually even carries Coalfield's name because they saw it for the first time in this paper. I, I think one of the potentially one of the re reasons is not only is it rare, it also bears a very superficial resemblance to Kelvin Helmholtz. Basically, intermediate water that is sort of in, in an ellipse type shape. And it superficially looks very similar. Um, and uh, most people who work in this area have heard of Kelvin Helmholtz since they first started researching this area and maybe have never even heard of these two. They might have heard of, of Holmbo and they've very rarely heard of the third. Um, so I think uh, potentially some people are saying that they see uh, Kelvin Helmholtz when actually they might have been seeing this instead, but they, they, there's no way to really tell until I guess we showed that, you know, that when you plot these particular quantities, they are yeah. very different. Um, and I think that's you know, maybe going forwards, there'll be more spottings of that other type. Okay, great. Thank you so much for just um, explaining that. We're going to move on to uh, a question that's been submitted by an audience member. So from Marie Louise, and uh, they are asking, what is the most promising technology for getting higher resolution data on these processes and generally on the deep ocean? Mm. So I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. I'm very much a theoretician more so than an ocean going oceanographer. Um, asking Alexis Kaminsky would um, would potentially um, aid you with that. Um, she has done both sides of, of this sort of work, ocean going stuff and also the theoretical stuff. Um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that the technology doesn't give us high enough resolution. I think the technology is really quite good. Um, it's just that we've used it um i mean we've used it as often as we can do but but you know every time you use it you need funding to use it um to go and measure a certain area and there's only a certain amount of funding enthusiasm to go out into the ocean and measure things uh, so i think it's more a case of what we do have is often very high quality we just don't necessarily have as much of it as we would like Fantastic, thank you. Next question uh, is from Phoebe and they're asking uh, a two-part question really. Um, so how is climate change impacting these mixing, these mixings that you've mentioned and some of the others that we didn't even have a chance to look into and what are those potential impacts that's coming from climate change? Mm. Yeah, so this is where I guess the research community's opinion is probably very split um, in terms of lots of different uh, potential answers. I think um, what a lot of people would assume, and I think it's to a certain extent correct, is that the amount of mixing is unlikely to change much due to climate change. However, the amount that needs to be mixed is likely to change. So there's going to be potentially bigger temperature differences across from top to bottom of the ocean, but the mechanisms are going to stay the same, most likely. So the, the, the mechanisms are the same, but now you've got more heat, you've got more heat to mix, potentially. Um, so you're kind of trying to do more work with the same tools um, in terms of the amount of ocean mixing that can happen. 
Okay, that's really interesting to hear. Um, and I, actually, I, I can confirm that we've got Alexis on, on the call right now, who's responded to uh, our earlier question, and we'll uh, potentially just uh, read that out in just a second. Um, so sh she's saying uh, that Alexis is here, and uh, Tom's answer you're, uh, covered most of what she would say in a quick response, and that there's a lot of ocean to measure, and measurements are really sparse. There's some additional technological challenges in measuring flows at depth, and uh, a lot of recent measurements have come from gliders and floats, which can be deployed autonomously and reach more remote locations. So it is uh, the amount of data being collected is, is expanding. Um, and uh, this is really great to see. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next question, question from Kamal, which is asking, are there some other studies focusing on the impact of these dynamics, uh, mixing dynamics on the particle distribution among the layers with different densities, such as trends forming part particle dispersion or those forming particle aggregation? So the short answer is I'm, I don't really know that the slightly longer answer is there is um, a lot more effort these days put into working out where particles are going to go in a certain flow. Um, there's a whole field called Lagrangian coherent structures, which studies where particles end up and where they accumulate and where they are trapped. Um, my understanding is that a lot of that type of research that's starting to be applied in oceanography is, is looking top down. So the currents that you're looking down on and, and horizontally where particles are going, you know, where you might trap microplastics and various things like that. I'm not actually aware at the moment, it doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I'm not aware at the moment of people doing the sort of the side on view, the depth view that, that I'm looking at and where particles move up and down. And I think there are, in fact, I did go to a talk somewhat recently about um, nutrient transport um, down through the ocean um, from the surface downwards um, based upon rotating structures that you get in the ocean and, and moving part uh, nutrients downwards um, and that's supplying some of the nutrients needed for, for wildlife. So I think people are starting to use some of these techniques but it's a little bit early days on that. Okay thank you. Next question is from Magda asking, is there a big difference in mixing efficiency between your three different types of instabilities? Yes. Um, yes, so, so mixing efficiency, roughly speaking, is um, you put a certain amount of energy into the flow and some of that energy goes into mixing the two fluids and some of that goes into just accelerating the water. Um, and the efficiency is how much goes into actually mixing the two fluids. Um, type A, the Kelvin Helmholtz, that is widely believed to be the most efficient mixing mechanism. It does the most, it has the largest efficiency. And in that simulation, the efficiency is very large for a brief period of time, and then it all dies out because the flow stops. Um, the Holmbo instability will typically have uh, maybe a factor of five smaller mixing efficiency, um, but it carries on for a very long time. So the cumulative effect could be comparable. Type C, the Taylor Caulfield um, instability, I've actually sort of simplified it quite a lot here. Something else that we did in this paper was to investigate the Taylor Caulfield instability in a lot more detail. And it actually depends on a lot of parameters for very long waves like the movies I showed, there's not much mixing and it's similar to the Hongbo. But for very short versions, um, there's an, an immense amount of mixing and it's, it's as efficient as Kelvin Helmholtz. Um, so there is a whole scale here in here as well, which I didn't really get a chance to uh, go into. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, we're gonna ask is from Julio asking, if the intensity of the mixing is not going to increase as a consequence of climate change, does it mean that over time there's going to be heat accumulation in the upper layers of the ocean while the lower layers are going to remain relatively stable? Again, I think that's a bit of an unknown. Um, it's, 
I guess I say it, it's my hypothesis that the intensity of mixing will not change. I, I can't see why it would, but it doesn't mean it won't. Um, I guess there are two scenarios. One is there, like you said, that there might be an accumulation of heat at the surface and then the bottom remains cold. The other scenario is that actually the mixing still happens pretty efficiently. It's just the entire ocean gets warmer. Um, and I really wouldn't like to put my penny down on one side of the of that or the other. I think either are, are reasonable. And I, I, there are almost certainly other people who are much more um, qualified to say which one is more likely than the other. OK, thank you very much, Tom. We have just gone over to a clock, so we are scheduled to end and I can't see that there are any more questions for us to work on. There is a comment in the Q&A from Anton, but I'll leave Tom for you to uh, note what's being said in that. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for being today's MAS webinar. It's been uh, really great to hear about your work and uh, answering our questions as uh, it's really great uh, for you to participate in that and thank you for everyone who is still with us after two o'clock uh, both on zoom and on youtube um, if you want to recap on anything that tom has spoken about today or want to share this recording to someone who may have missed this talk then you can check out the mast youtube channel um, and you'll find a recording of this talk and the q a there later today um, that's everything from us so thank you very much tom Thank you. For anyone who is still with us watching on YouTube or Zoom, I would just like to highlight that next week's uh, MAS webinar it is Brian Wilson from the University of Oxford, and he's going to be talking about uh, corals and some of the work that he's been taking in far and distant lands. So uh, if this is something that you would like to listen to, then please check out this webinar, sign up for the, in the same location that you did for Tom's talk. And um, if you're thinking, what else have we got in store? Well, then we have loads of other talks coming up, all of which are free. You can sign up to them at any point. Uh, we have a variety of subjects being covered and we're running all the way up until May. So uh, please check out some of uh, the other web webinars that we have coming up. You'll find uh, the sign up information on the MAST's website, which is at the top. You can see the URL at the top left of the screen. And we hope that you can join us again very soon. So I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. And if you want to recap on anything, check out our MAST YouTube channel later today. <laughs>